Okay, so why don't we why don't we go ahead and get started? So, my name is Mark Lamonica. I'm the product manager for Morningstar Premium and Morningstar.com.au. Will is turning the lights up on me. Apparently, that means I look terrible. Um, First, our housekeeping items. So I'll start with a new one today. We are recording this. We'll put this on our YouTube channel, Will's Pride and Joy, and, uh, and then we'll also put it on the website. Other thing, anything you hear today is general advice. I obviously don't know anything about you. I can't offer any personal advice. And I would like questions, so please ask questions. So I think today will be interesting, but that's just me. So why don't we get started? We're gonna look back at two different market crashes and try to learn some lessons that maybe are applicable today. So if anyone was there for my rant on Thursday about how everything's overvalued, um, hopefully this is that follow-up that will um, give you some ideas, if you agree with that, of things you can look out for. So let's get started. Here we go. All right, lessons from the past. Okay, so I like quotes, so we're going to start with some quotes. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the Nifty 50. Um, so if you don't know what that is, you will soon learn about it. So two different quotes and a couple things to think about. So the Nifty 50 refers to um, the stock market in the 60s, uh, which was a very, very good decade for the stock market. And we've got two different quotes on here. One, we've got Warren Buffett. So for those of you who know the history of Warren Buffett, so after he got out of business school, he came back and he started a partnership, the Buffett Partnership, which was very famous because he did very, very well with this. And he was a pure value investor at that time. Um, he has since changed course. But this first quote is in 1969. So towards the end of this bull market, Buffett closed his partnership, famously, and basically said that whatever's happening with the markets now, I don't understand it. So as he said, I'm not going to try to play a game that I don't understand. So he closed his partnership, kept a small textile company he had purchased in New England called Berkshire Hathaway, and the rest is kind of history. But anyway, it was this market and this run-up to the crash that I'm going to talk about, the Nifty 50 crash, that got Buffett out of his partnership. And then, of course, we have Richard Nixon. Um, if I had spare cash, I'd buy stocks now. Well, that would have been a terrible decision because a couple years after that, there was a pretty big crash. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, let's talk about what does this Nifty 50 actually mean? So basically, the Nifty 50 were 50 gross stocks, and they were not in any sort of index. And there was a little bit of disagreement about what should actually be included in this. But they performed really well in the 60s and the early 70s. And there was no real unifying theme, or not much of a unifying theme, between all of them. But um, a lot of them, they were across a bunch of different industries, so consumer, healthcare, technology, but they really didn't include any cyclical stocks, so cyclical stocks that move with the economy, like, well, resources to a certain extent, but oil, steel, auto companies, to go back to some of the companies that existed back, uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s. But the one thing that all these companies shared was they were all very high quality companies, um, so they were benefiting from a lot of the economic growth in the 60s, and they had very strong balance sheets. So they were all very good companies. And we'll obviously go into some detail, but I threw a couple of the Nifty 50 up there. So hopefully these are names that you still recognize. Um, I obviously deliberately, um, I deliberately put things on there that, uh, that, I thought, um, that I thought you'd recognize. But anyway, that's them. Um, so, what happened? Well, oh geez, what happened is the font doesn't look very good on this slide. So that's one thing that happened. Um, so what, what happened with the Nifty 50? Well, basically we got to a point where, um, and during this decade, it's also important to note, and we'll, we'll go through a common theme when we look back at this crash, the next one, and then, uh, and then talk about where we are right now, is it was a decade during the 60s where there were, and this is obviously we're looking at the U.S. market, but there was increasing interest from investors in the market. So 
By the end of the decade, so by the end of the 60s, seven times as many Americans held shares um, than at the beginning of the, uh, of the decade. And a lot of this at the time, because it was still very expensive to buy shares, a lot of this time was through funds, so mutual funds in the U.S. or managed funds here, but still huge increase in interest from investors, which is something that happens in basically every bubble. Um, so we can get into some of this. So what happened with these nifty 50 companies? Well, basically the media and a lot of people and a lot of financial professionals came out and they said that these were one decision stocks, meaning you buy them and you hold them forever and that price didn't matter. So this, of course, this attitude allowed these stocks to run up. So if you look at these nifty 50 stocks, 41.9 was the price to earnings ratio in 1972. Um, so that is double what the S&P 500 was. So it was at 18.9. So very, very high. Fifth of these, 20% of these firms had price to earnings ratios in excess of 50. And Polaroid was the most expensive one, selling it over 90 times earnings. So for those, I think Polaroid cameras are actually back now. Um, I think they're popular again. There's a lot of strange things that are popular, um, but I'll, I'll get into that. But anyway, Polaroids were very popular at the time. So as you'd expect, because stocks are really expensive, the average dividend yield was very low. So it got to be 1.1%, less than half of the other stocks. Now, this, we can call it a bubble, this huge run during the 60s ended in the early 70s. So 73 and 74 was the, as you can read, the worst bear market since the Great Depression. Um, and there are a couple different things that triggered this. So as we got into the early 70s, inflation started to pick up. Um, so interest rates were raised. Um, oil prices, so that's when we first started seeing some of the oil shocks coming, and you know, Watergate was happening, so there was some political instability. But all these things triggered this 73-74 bull market. So the S&P 500 went down 42%. Um, so as I was saying the other day, all these people that are very stressed out when the market goes down 3%, it can go down a lot more. So 42% took close to six years to get back to that high water mark. And this was actually a global downturn. Um, so I'm concentrating on the US a little bit here, but the UK market got slammed even more. It didn't come back for 13 years. And if you think about that, if you look at 13 years, it came back literally right before the 87 crash, um, which, uh, <laughs> which isn't a great time to get back to the high water mark. Um, now, stocks got very cheap during this whole period. Um, so you can see right now, we've been talking about CAPE ratio. So we're somewhere up around 27, 28 times. So that's a cyclically adjusted P ratio. So we're smoothing out um, those year to year fluctuations in earnings. We're looking at a 10 year period. So CAPE ratio got down to 8.3. And if we look at that historically, just as we're at one of the high points that we've ever seen from the CAPE ratio right now, 93% of other periods, it's cheaper than 93% of other periods since 1900. And as I said, funds were the vehicle that people were using to invest. So this sevenfold increase in investors over this decade, um, you can see that, wow, that's a typo. From 1960 to 1965, not 1065, the year before England was invaded, um, 1965, assets of mutual funds doubled. From 1965 to 1970, they doubled again, and of course they peaked in 1972. So anytime you see any of this stuff, all of these peaks always occur right before something bad happens. Um, so that is the nifty 50. Now, Jeremy Siegel, um, who is a professor and won a Nobel Prize, um, did an analysis. Now, he did this analysis in 1998, um, for no particular reason other than that's what he was doing in 1998. But I still thought that this was worthwhile to look through. So he created this chart. So if you, if you have very good eyesight, you can read all the names of the Nifty 50 in that chart. But ask me for this and I can send it to you and send you a link. So what he did is he went back and he looked at what would happen if you bought these 50 companies, because these were all 
and still are, in the most part, great companies. Um, companies that are still around, a lot of them, still significantly uh, a large part of our economy and a large part of the stock market. So he thought, what if you went back and you actually bought these in 1972 at their actual peak? What would happen? Um, and because it's 1998, he looked at that period. And so I thought this was an interesting, uh, an interesting study. So overall, if you look at the portfolio, so I pulled it out right here. So if you rebalance the Nifty 50, so this is if you take an equal weighted investment in the 50 shares in there and rebalance it every year versus non-rebalance, you just let it run. Um, you start equal weighted and you let it run. He looked at the annualized return, so pretty good. Um, between the peak, and remember this is the peak, 12.5% versus 12.2% a year um, for, uh, for the Nifty 50. The S&P returned 12.7%. Um, so if you look at that, and remember, you're paying a lot more for the earnings here than you are for the S&P 500, and you can see what they've actually did, done is they grew earnings faster. Now what I took in this chart, is an overall 15 companies. If you just look at pure companies, um, you're not looking at the degree that they, that they beat the S&P 500. And obviously, they, these 15 companies beat it by a lot and dragged up those overall returns. So if you look at, um, if you look at 15 companies outperformed, so I listed the top 10 that are companies that still exist. Now, many of the companies on here were purchased. Um, by other companies. So in, a lot of them happened actually since 1998. So even if you start looking at this list, we go down the top performers. So Philip Morris, um, they've split a lot, but that is, uh, well, it's Philip Morris, Altria, Kraft. They have all sorts of different uh, derivations in the market. Cigarette company, Pfizer, of course, which is we hear about all the time now, trying to get the Pfizer jab. Um, Bristol Myers. So Bristol Myers bought Squibb, which is another company on this list. Gillette's number four, and Gillette, of course, was purchased by Procter & Gamble. So you'll see a lot of these companies did consolidate. But I took off those ones that have been purchased. Um, and here are the top 10. And I went back and I looked at Morningstar moats. So, right, we always talk about a moat rating, and moat rating is a sustainable competitive advantage. All of these companies, and just so everyone's aware, Morningstar was not around in 1972. We were started in 1984, but all of these companies you can see have moats, with the exception of General Electric has a narrow moat. Everyone else has a wide moat. And so these are the annualized returns that all these companies be, made. I can't speak. Those are the annualized returns that all these companies um, got in that time period. J&J &J down here is the only one, and by you know a tenth of a percent, that underperformed the S&P 500. And then you can see that 1972 PE that you have. So a couple things that I thought jumped out on us, jumped out at me. All of these companies, with the exception of Coca-Cola and Merck, all of them had PEs that were below, in some cases significantly below, the P of the overall Nifty 50, if you, if you look at the average. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that jumped out is, and I would back, and this was not part of, uh, this was not part of the analysis, um, but I went back and I looked at market returns during that 73 and 74. And this will get into some of the conclusions we're hopefully going to make in a second. Um, so you can see that they all fell pretty significantly during that time period. Um, and that will go into a next point. But just I thought that was, I thought that was interesting. Um, so what, what Siegel was saying when he went back and looked at this is he was saying that basically at the end of the day, even though the valuation levels were pretty high, in many cases, those valuation levels were justified. Um, and they didn't underperform the S&P that much. Um, I have a little bit of a different take on it. But, uh, but yeah, it's an interesting point. And, you know, it's a point about growth stocks and what we're trying to buy and really stocks with competitive advantages. So what are the conclusions that at least I came up with for... Uh, for the Nifty 50, and let's and we'll talk about how this impacts what we're doing today. Okay, so the first point: great companies with sustainable competitive advantages can grow significantly faster than the overall market, and these are the stocks you want to hold that have multi decades of strong returns. Um, so 
all of the, everything that happened with the Nifty 50, and we'll get into a lot of other crashes are very different. All of the companies on that list were quality companies. Now, some of them obviously didn't survive. A lot of them were purchased. Things like Polaroid, um, from a technology standpoint, obviously was replaced by lots of other things. But still, looking at a large group of great companies, those competitive advantages flow year after year after year and allow those companies to continue to expand. The other thing that's important that I do think plays in today's market is the biggest winners are always going to be more expensive on a relative basis. So when we're looking at growth, when we're looking at growth stocks, good or bad, from a valuation perspective, they're always going to be more expensive. So as investors, what we need to do is identify great companies, but we do need to take valuation into account. Valuation does still matter, particularly when we look at the companies on that list that performed well. Um, and most of them had valuation levels that were below the rest of the nifty 50. The other thing, going back and looking at this list, and it's hard, obviously, you know, despite what many people think, I was not alive during the Nifty 50. Um, so some of those companies, a lot of those companies are still household names, which I think is really striking, uh, but some certainly aren't. And, you know, if we look at overall returns, this is why it's really important to diversify, because things change over time. Um, and there are a lot of companies that will flame out. So whether that is a, uh, whether that's, a Polaroid, for example, or some of the other companies on the list, there are going to be problems. That's why we diversify in general. So that's the Nifty 50. We'll spend a little more time on the next crash. Um, but I think, uh, I think overall, and, and one point I wanted to make with this 73-74 fall. So obviously, in hindsight, everyone can go back and look at a market like this or any market and say that it's really, really overvalued. But Think about how great your returns would be if you would have waited a couple years. Um, so if you sat there and we looked at these returns, so Philip Morris returned 18.8% a year um, between, uh, between 74, or no, sorry, this was 72, between 1972 and 1998. That is tremendous, right? Um, so that is a really, really small return. But if you would have waited a couple years, you could have gotten it for a lot cheaper. It fell 24%. And that's sort of across the board. Coca-Cola, 16.2%. It fell close to 63% if you would have waited a couple years. So, you know, I think one thing, and, and we'll talk about this a little in the past, is what I'm doing right now and what I've been doing is making lists of great companies I want to earn or I want to own. Um, because you start making those lists now, and then if there is a discount that the market offers, then you'll be ready to go in there. And you can do research. Remember, research on these companies, people are so fixated on price. You can do research on companies and study their business models and understand what the drivers are without looking at the price at all, because the price is irrelevant. Then you can start looking at the price when it actually gets cheaper and you want to buy them. So start making lists of great companies. If you're worried that we're in a bubble, think about those companies that you always wanted to own. Things that, were, if we were sitting here talking in Australia, CSL. So CSL, clearly a great company, clearly really expensive and has had a huge run. Start making lists. And when these things go on sale, you can pounce on them. I'm going the wrong way. All right, we're going to move on to more recent history. So we're going to talk about the dot-com crash. And so I've got, once again, two different quotes here that I think are pretty good. So Alan Greenspan in 1996, so he was the head of the Fed, so the chairman of the Fed, um, gave his famous irrational exuberance speech. Um, so this is one of the famous, a long, but famous quotes from that. Um, and let me know if this sounds familiar. So everybody decided that there was going to be low inflation and less uncertainty about the future. What does that mean? That means we have lower risk premiums. So what he's saying is we are now willing to pay more for uh, or lower risk premiums or what we're using as discount rates that go into how we value stocks. What does that imply? What does that create? Higher stock prices and other assets. All right. So but how do we know when a rational exuberance has unduly escalated asset, asset values, which then become subject to unexpected and prolonged contractions? 
And he's talking about Japan, obviously, at that time. Japan had been in a pretty, the Nikkei, which peaked in the late 80s, um, and still is well below that level. Um, he's saying, how do we know when these asset levels are too high? And also, how do we know when this future that we've all forecast um, is, uh, is going to actually change? So you think about the 90s, everything was great. The Cold War was over. Um, the West had won. But, uh, but yeah, we learned, uh, we learned early, in 2000, early in the 2000s that uh, there were other problems out there. And then, of course, I think this is a great quote. And the background to this quote is um, Cheap Tickets was a competitor of Priceline. So the background is Priceline went public at $16 a share in March 1999, almost right at the top. On its first day of trading, it went up to $88 a share. So 16 to 88, pretty interesting. Went down a little bit though, closed that day at $69 a share. So Priceline became the large or the first day, the highest first day valuation of any internet company. It was worth $9.8 billion, um, which is good. Well, so what happened in the first couple quarters that Priceline was in business? It lost $142 million. And what Priceline was is you went in on, you know, the internet and bid on different tickets. So we're talking about trips here. So airline tickets and hotels and things like that. It was the whole you name the price thing. And they somehow created this system where they were losing on average $30 for every ticket they sold. Um, but, you know, they're getting lots of traffic. So that was exciting. Um, so interesting business model where you lose money on every transaction you have. So this guy, Michael Hartley, was the CEO of Cheap Tickets, one of their competitors. And he said, yeah, the problem with Cheap Tickets is we've decided that we're actually going to make money. And that hurts our valuation um, as, uh, as opposed to what was happening at Priceline. So I like that quote and the story. I thought it was pretty good. Um, one other thing that happened, if, if people do remember this period, so during the dot com, um, well, the run up before we get to the crash. Um, once again, a lot of interest from individual investors and personal investors. So this is also when a lot of the online brokers came out, which obviously made the process easier and people were buying direct shares. Um, it's the era where CNBC was started. So basically that investing now had become a, uh, a alternative sport that people would go and, and watch TV on it all day. Crazy stuff happened on CNBC. Um, so yeah, interesting, interesting period. Um, I think a lot of parallels in my mind with today, where once again, everyone is talking about investing. Um, and uh, a lot of new investors have entered the market. Certainly some parallels back to Nifty 50, um, which, uh, which is interesting. So let's go a little more Let's talk about the craziness, right? So I think right now, the Nifty 50 were established strong companies. Um, one aspect of this whole dot-com mania, and, um, and in my mind, what's happening now, is that people are investing in a lot of crazy speculative stuff. So this is a good little fact that I decided to throw on the slide. So 199 internet stocks tracked by Morgan Stanley. So $450 billion is what these 199 stocks were worth. And they weren't making any money or even, didn't even have any sales. So $21 billion in sales, which is interesting. And annual profits, no profits, $6.2 billion in losses. So these are 200 companies. This is not one company that we think is going to make money and that everyone has really analyzed. This is everything that has a dot com attached to it. So that is the definition of mania. If anyone has listened to Investing Compass, our SPAC episode, looks pretty similar to what's happening with SPACs right now. Um, we've got, uh, and we didn't even talk about really some of the craziness during, during the episode, but yeah, we've got personal helicopter, the Uber of helicopters that thinks maybe in 10 years they'll have a helicopter that can come pick you up and take you somewhere. Those are companies being acquired by SPACs. There's a lot of craziness going on. Some other stuff, a couple of examples down here, Boo.com. So this is my favorite one that I found. Um, so Boo.com was going to be a pioneer in the e-commerce space. So this was going to be 
Amazon. Um, so it was founded in 98 and was selling branded fashion apparel. And it burned through $135 million in two years and went out of business. So nice work by Boo.com. Webvan is a famous one. So Webvan, a concept that we know about now, right? At home food delivery. Um, so they were a $1.2 billion company with 4,500 employees across the US. They were out of business in two years. And this sock puppet, and I spent a lot of time searching for the sock puppet's name. I don't think it had a name, but it was very famous. It was on Regis and Kathy Lee and Good Morning America. Um, and it had a Super Bowl ad. So that sock puppet is, uh, is the symbol for Pets.com. Um, so Pets.com, famously, they went bankrupt in November 2000. Um, they went public in February of 2000, so, you know, a long-life company. Um, they raised $82.5 million in February 2000 and went bankrupt the same year. And during that year, they earned $619,000 in revenue and spent $11.8 million on advertising. And a lot of their advertising was around this sock puppet, um, which is good. All right, last... Uh, last speculative mania that we'll go into. Um, let's talk about IPOs. So companies aren't stupid. Whoever invented this, spot, this sock puppet and Boo.com and Webvan um, all probably made a ton of money because what do all the founders do when there are periods like this? They just go public because going public serves a lot of different purposes. But one reason you go public is because if you are the if you started a company or you're an early venture investor in a company, you want to get paid. So how do you get paid back on the share of the company you own? You go public. So lots of people go public during times like this are rushing to get this in. So let's look at IPOs. So 1999, 486 IPOs in the US, 429 in the year 2000. Those both shattered records. 60% of the total IPOs in 1999 um, were internet companies, compared to 14% in 1998. Now, let's look at this chart. What jumps out at you? Oh, look what happened in 2020. We've broken 400 again, um, which is interesting. So the highest levels since back in 2000. And I've been trying to find a way to confirm this. I got one source for it. I'll keep looking. I saw a source that said that there have been 325 IPOs that have happened in the US in 2021, so far this year. And for those that don't have a calendar in front of them, it's March 16th, which incidentally is my mother's birthday. Um, so, and she's watching. She sent me all these text messages saying, why hasn't this started when the time changed in the US? So I guess happy birthday, mother. It was not really her birthday till tomorrow, so I'll call her tomorrow. But March 16th, 325 IPOs. So you should be worried about that. And a lot of these IPOs have been SPACs. Um, so that, uh, yeah, something to think about. And we'll get more into SPACs. All right, so we went through all the speculative stuff. Now, what happened to all the people that invested in all these speculative internet companies that were going to change the world by selling pet supplies to, I don't know who, the sock puppet was selling you pet supplies. Um, what happened to all these people that invested in this stuff? They all lost all their money. Now, not all of it. So the NASDAQ, where a lot of these um, companies actually listed not lose all their money, I was exaggerating. It only went down 78%. So 78%, the NASDAQ went down. So think about that when we, uh, when we, start, uh, when we start looking at, um, when we start looking at where, uh, where we are today. And one other thing, I guess, about these 2020, um, these 2020 numbers is 80% of the money that came out in IPOs last year was in three buckets, SPACs, technology and healthcare. So when you start thinking about where there could be a bubble now, think about those. One other thing about the NASDAQ, so yeah, it went down 78%. It did not get back up to that level that it was at. So it peaked on March 10th, 2000. Didn't get back to that level until March 2015. 
15 years to get back to that level, which is pretty crazy. Um, but let's not just talk about terrible companies and speculative things. Um, let's talk about some companies we've heard of. Because once again, we can talk about valuation. So Cisco, so I actually own Cisco. To be clear, I did not own Cisco in 2000. I bought it much later than that. But so Cisco is a real company. So Cisco sells, of course, um, a lot of the hardware at that point sort of changed the software that drove the internet. So the routers and everything else that, uh, that drove the internet. So Cisco um, is, uh, is an example of a great company that got bid up to absurd levels. So Cisco's PE was 62.6. Um, which, is, uh, which is pretty high. Today it's trading at 16.1. Now over this time, so in March 2000, where it peaked, Cisco had the highest PE. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I was wrong. The 10 biggest stocks in the S&P 500 by market cap, the PE ratio was 62.6. Cisco had the highest at 196.2. Followed by Oracle, another real company that's still around, um, that was at 148.4. So what happened? Well, over time, it fell from, I'm sorry for the wrong numbers for, 196.2 to 14.39. And this is over this, this period right now. It is still below. So we're in 2021, as everyone's, everyone is aware. 21 years later, it's still 36% below where it was at the peak of the bubble. And this is, a, to my opinion, I own it. It's a really great company. It generates a lot of cash. Um, it, uh, it's a good company. So, and over this time, the revenue grew 160%. Yet it is still worth less than it was at the top of the peak. So here's an example of if you're a Cisco holder that held on, and I'd love to talk to the people that actually managed to do this, if you held on from March 2000 till today, you still need to get 37% to even break even, which is interesting. Microsoft. So Microsoft is, what is it, the second biggest company in the world right now, I think, behind, uh, behind Apple. So Microsoft has broken where it was in the tech bubble, but it did it in 2016. So it still took 16 years for it to get back there. Now, during this 16 year period, um, between, it actually peaked in 1999, I think the end of 99, yep, the end of 99. Um, during that 16 year period, revenue grew 361% or 10% a year over 16 years, which is incredible, right? That they grew revenue 10% a year over 16 years, but, Either way, as an investor, you were barely up if you go in this period, so 2.65%. Now, since then, it's done very well, but Microsoft was 74 times earnings. It's now trading at 35.87. So that's a pretty big run up from the 29 it was then. But either way, it's still high, it's still well above the market, but the fact that it was trading at 74 times earnings is, yeah, a lot. Amazon, so everyone loves Amazon. So Amazon um, took eight years to get back to where it was. Um, and over that eight years, and over the two years from when it peaked in 99, um, it lost 90% of the value over two years. So it would've been nice to get into Amazon then, um, got back to basically level um, after, uh, yeah, after eight years. And then clearly it's done very well now, but 9% haircut is, uh, is a lot. And once again, that was a good company. It is a great company. It was growing the whole time, um, but the valuation level was just way out of control. So what are our lessons from dot-com? So we talked about speculation. So the speculation in the market was certainly more widespread than it was in 73, 74, where these are real established quality companies. Um, and if you were a speculator, you got pummeled. So as I said, NASDAQ fell 78%. Um, and there were a lot of individual investors that were speculators back then. Um, so, you know, I talked about, um, I talked about 
new people entering the market. So 40% of individual investors in the US that had financial assets between 25,000 and 99,000 made their first stock trade after January 1996. And this is data when we were looking at it in 2000. Um, so a lot of new investors were going to the market. And of course, they were chasing all of these, uh, these crazy stocks. So one other thing, and I, and I, as an example of speculation, I put this in for you, Will. So guess what they started during the dot-com era? Online currencies. Now, they are different than the ones now, and Will could get on here for 45 minutes and tell us about it, but there was something called Flows, which was launched in 1999 as a currency designed to be used by internet merchants. And you could purchase flows, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, directly, or you get credits as, from online retailers as a loyalty bonus. And it became really, really popular with a particular set of consumers, and that was the Russian mafia. And they use it as part of a stolen credit card ring. Um, so they really liked that. Now the company, of course, shut down in 2001, and all the unused flows became non-refundable and went out of business. There was another company called Benz. They raised $100 million from investors and they went bankrupt. Um, the interesting thing about flows, Whoopi Goldberg was promoting it. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. So what is a lesson around speculation is think about some of the speculative stuff that's happening now. I looked back and, and we'll get into some of those those real companies in a bit, but think about what's happening. So these buy now, pay later companies, um, all these small resources companies in Australia um, that a lot of investors are going into, even some of these sector specific ETFs that people are buying, um, options, options trading is way up. You should not be investing in options, in my opinion. Um, so. Think about some of the speculative things, maybe some of these cryptocurrencies, hoping Will does not come across the table at me, um, but think about some of these speculative investments um, because a lot of speculators get wiped out. All right, this next one, valuation levels matter. We talked about this before. Make a list of great companies, but don't necessarily buy them right now if you think the market's in a bubble and you think it's going to fall. Because if you bought Amazon after it gone down 90%, if you bought Microsoft after it gone down significantly, you would have made a ton of money. Um, so think about valuation levels and remember that the problem in a lot of these bubbles as the market keeps going up and keeps going up, the problem is that you have this fear of missing out, FOMO, um, one of you know my many acronyms I know, so you're not even paying attention. Um, what happens is people think that if they don't buy stuff immediately, they the market's gonna run away from them. We're seeing the same thing in housing, right? Well, you can wait and have patience. And if you hold cash for a couple years and wait a little bit, that's not the worst thing in the world. The other thing that we should talk about is passive investing. So passive is quote unquote safe. Um, now it's not, right? That's just the perception that passive has. You're not making any decisions, but we need to look at allocations of the market from different sectors. So if we go back and we look at 2000, the tech sector made up at the start of 2000, 29% of the S&P 500 in the US and it peaked at 35% in March of that year. And then that's when the fall started. So the tech sector went down 40% in, uh, in 2000. Then all of a sudden it was 21% of the index. It went down another 26% in 2001, 37% in 2002. And so it made up 14.3% of the index. Now what happens if you're a passive investor? You are getting dragged down by this sector, because as in a market capitalization weighted index, as things do well, they make up more and more of the index. So remember, 2000, tech sector made up 29% of the index. It's 27% now of the S&P 500. And if you include companies like Google and Facebook that are not technically in the tech sector, it's even more. And not to mention all these other internet enabled companies like Amazon. So something to think about. Um, that, you know, 
in situations like this, um, you may not be safe from a passive perspective. Now, there are options you can come out, you can uh, work on. Number one, you could obviously pick an active manager if you thought an active manager could allocate money um, in a better way. But you can also buy an equal weighted index, for example, uh, where you're not putting so much of your investment into certain companies. And we've got the same thing going on in Australia. Um, just, I would argue, not as speculative parts of the market. Um, banks make up a huge part of the index here. If you take banks and some of the large resource companies, that's a lot of the index. But just know what you're buying with passive. Um, so yeah, you are going to get the average return as a passive investor, but just be careful what that average return is. All right. The other thing around, um, around what I'd argue with passive is we talked before about how there's been this huge run up in currently in large cap growth stocks. Now the same thing happened back in 2000. So in 2000, the NASDAQ fell 39%. But the Wilshire 5000 large cap value index gained 17%. So what really happened at the end of the day during this fall is who got wiped out? Well, people who invested on the NASDAQ got wiped out. A lot of the speculators got wiped out. People who allocated too much money to large cap growth stocks, namely these technology stocks, did not do well. But the market overall actually did pretty well. Um, particularly if you took more of a value perspective. Um, and the same thing if you go back and look at how the S&P 500 performed when you remove certain sectors. So namely, like the two biggest sort of bubble sectors were obviously tech, which we've talked about. And then the other thing was um, all these companies like WorldCom that were laying fiber optic, fiber optic cables that were in um, communications. Um, so for people that don't remember that, there's Global Crossing, there's WorldCom. Um, I bought WorldCom back when I was investing from my dorm room in uni. Not the best idea, but it was actually probably the best idea I had in college. Um, all those companies laid all these fiber optic cables, which interestingly enough, the US had this glut of fiber optic cables, nobody used any of them, and then all of a sudden we got a faster internet, phones, everything else, and we had all this fiber optic cable laying around, so it was actually, it actually wasn't bad. Um, the other thing that I would say that, uh, that certainly worries me and we made this point the other week around retail investors is a lot of new people got into the market and were traumatized by their losses. So, you know, when their pets.com dominated portfolio went down to next to nothing, they all pulled out of the market. And what happened after this crash? Well, so the crash started in 2000, 2001, 2002. What happened after that? We had the biggest bull market in history um, that's still going on today. I mean, technically it ended last February, March with that, you know, three week bear market we had. But for all practical purposes, that run up has still lasted to today. Um, so that's what kind of worries me. Um, I think it's great that there's a lot of interest right now from new investors in the market, but I am worried a little bit that, uh, that yeah, they will be traumatized and will not, um, will not keep up with it. And we all know that the way that you're a successful investor is over the long term where you're able to compound those returns. All right. Wow, that lasted 45 minutes. Um, okay, so we've got a couple questions. Um, let's, uh, let's get into them. So two questions from Lisa. Um, so, Lisa says, um, so she's saying, she's saying, will all these speculative investments, SPACs, um, and a crash all happen back to back? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, like, I don't know if it's going to happen. And I guess I would say that. I, I obviously have my personal opinion, which should be obvious, um, that things are getting very worrisome. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that... Uh, I think that if we start looking at the really speculative stuff, it does tend to build on it, on um, build on itself. So yeah, I think that if you're investing in SPACs, I'd be pretty worried. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think a lot of the speculative stuff tends to get wiped out because it's the same people doing it. 
Um, so Lisa say, why are options not a good plan right now in your opinion? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about options. So um, I'm talking about like naked call options. Um, so options can be used for a lot of different things. Options can be used to hedge things and just so people know what an option is. So an option is the right but not the obligation to purchase or sell a share. So if you invest in a call option, what are you saying? So you're basically saying that if I invest in pick something boring. If I invest in a Telstra call option and I buy that option at, let's say, $5. I think Telstra's in the threes right now. If I buy it at $5, that means whenever that option is due, so they can be long dated options, like a leap option, or they can be short options. Whenever that option is actually due, I have the right, but not the obligation to buy shares at that price. So what I would do is I would buy the shares if of course, um, and you never actually buy them. You're basically, well, anyway, I have the option of buying the shares um, at a certain price. I would only buy the shares if they were worth more than that. So if Telstra is worth $10, I'd say, hey, great. Yeah, of course, I'd buy it. Um, now, the problem is if it's not $5 in this case, what happens? Well, I lose all my money because I've never buy the shares for more than they're worth. So all of the money that I paid for this options contract is just gone. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of people are using options to dial up the risk and return that they can get on some of these shares. So um, if you look at if you look at options, I'm, I had a chart somewhere. I mean, they are it is up, I mean, I can't even read this chart probably because I'm too old. Um, but yeah, just looking at this chart, I mean, they are multiple 60, 70% higher options trading activity in 2020 than it ever has been before. And these are all retail investors going out and buying options. Now you can use an option to hedge a position. So that is not a naked option because you naked option means you don't own the underlying share, but you can use options to actually hedge a position. Um, but that's not what all these people are doing. They're buying options to try to amplify the return that they're able to get if stuff keeps going up. And I talked the other day about my friend Jackie, and her dad is trading options on SPACs, um, which, yeah, is pretty crazy. But anyway, um, so I don't think options are a great idea for retail investors um, just because of that risk and return profile, the fact that you have a very good chance of losing all of your money on options. Um, all right, so we've got a question from Nina. What is an example of an equal weighted ETF? Well. I appear to have closed. Hold on a second. I'll find one for you. Um, so once again, an equal weighted ETF is simply an ETF that, uh, that instead of being market capitalization weighted, it is instead whatever index you have. So a ASX 200 um, ETF. Sorry, I'm trying to look one up on a screener. That would mean equal money goes into all 200 stocks. So let's try to find one on here. Uh, all right, let me, here's one. All right, let me share my screen. So what I would do is all of these will say this in the name. Um, and you can Google this as well, but then I would go back and look at our research. All right, so this is Vanek Vector's Australian Equal Weighted ETF. We rate it silver. Um, so what that means, and let's go look at, see what this actually tracks. Um, so where are we here? Um, 101 equity holdings. Okay, so yeah, I'm not sure the exact index. I can find that somewhere. But you can find equal weighted e ETFs. Hopefully it should list. Um, okay, the S&P uh, ASX 200. So this is basically the ASX 200 that it's tracking. So that's an example of an equal weighted ETF. But they are out there um, in equal weighted funds as well. Um, so it's uh, an approach you can take. Um, okay, so we've got... Uh, 
Okay, so we've got a question saying, based on your opinion, would you sit on cash right now and not buy anything until there's a correction? Would you sell shares that you've made money on now and wait? Um, all right, so let's uh, let's talk about, like I can't, number one, obviously, give any sort of personal advice and everyone's personal situation is different. Um, what I will say is, you know, I don't think that sitting on cash for a couple of years is the worst thing in the world. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of my friends are now sending me pictures of bears because they think I'm some sort of bear. Um, but I checked this morning and still of my investment portfolio, 90% is invested. So yeah, I've raised the cash allocation to 10%. Um, and I've done that by selectively selling a couple things, but I've mostly done it by not investing more. So the money I'm saving and putting into these accounts is just sitting there in cash and dividends. I've been collecting dividends for the last couple of years and not been reinvesting them. Now, I have no idea where the market is going to go. Uh, I'm certainly not one to ever advocate that you should sit there and try to time the market. And I know that's a little bit what I'm doing, but I'm not selling things. Um, I guess my attitude at this point is I have, if I sit there and look at my goals, the returns that I've achieved have far exceeded what I thought would happen. Um, so I'm in a really good place from a goal perspective. So I don't need to invest more at this point. My portfolio, even with 10% of it in cash, is way higher than I thought it would be. So I need to have some self-awareness that this has happened and realize I'm in a better spot than I would be. And I don't need to continue pouring money still into my portfolio. Now, if I if the market continues to go well, I'll benefit from that because 90% of my portfolio is still invested um, in, uh, in equities. So, I mean, I guess that's my perspective, but that's where you need to look at where you are and what your actual goals are. If you're approaching retirement and you do have enough to pay for your retirement and you're comfortable with where you are, then maybe you want to take some volatility off the table. If you're a really young investor um, and you know that you're going to continue to save and earn for years ahead, then keep investing, keep following your plan. Um, so it really depends upon your personal situation. Yeah, okay, so good good point by Edward. So Edward says the biggest problem with options is that people do not understand the implied volatility, which impacts option prices. So there's this Black-Scholes pricing model for options, which is very complicated. And there are a lot of different things that go into it, but one of the huge things that goes into it is volatility, and that is gonna bounce around options prices. Um, so yeah, good point, Edward. People don't understand it. I, I gave a very simplistic um, description of options, which, well, factually correct, doesn't involve all the different inputs that go into what an actual option price is, which is what you're paying. So the price is what you're paying for this right and not the obligation to buy a share. Um, all right, so another question saying, would you invest in ETFs that invest in renewables, ETFs in semiconductors? Um, I would just be careful. Like, I, I guess I would just be careful around these ETFs that come out following very, very narrow spreads of the market. And the reason I'd be uncomfortable is because why do they come out? Because the marketing departments come up with them. Um, it's not the investment folks. If you're going to buy an ETF that's following one of these thematics that could completely make sense and happen, but doesn't necessarily make it a good investment. Just like all of these, the WorldCom example that, uh, and the Global Crossing example that we used, that I used, um, is an example where, hey, correctly so, the market decided that, hey, this internet thing is going to catch on. And in order to support the internet, what do you need? Well, you need Cisco to create routers, to build routers. You need um, fiber optic cables laid so you can actually get the internet to people. All of this stuff happened. And it was still all a terrible, terrible investment um, because there was a huge glut of it. And so I think in some of these cases where anytime somebody attaches renewables to it, you know, everyone's decided, okay, we are in a spot where, you know, we need to get carbon levels down. And so renewals, renewables will, of course, be more popular. And I agree with that, but that doesn't make it a good investment. Um, so when people come out here and say obvious things that are going to happen, um, yeah, it worries me. It worries me that if, if something seems really obvious, 
that doesn't make it a good investment. And this has happened over and over time. Like if you go back to the 1800s, there's railroads. So railroads started and everyone thought, hey, this makes a lot of sense. We'll put stuff on a train instead of dragging it in a, in a carriage. Yeah, that made sense. What happened? They built railroads all over the US, all over London, and all of the railroad companies went out of business because they built too many railroads. Now, we still use railroads, and railroads obviously caught on and were great for society and commerce and everything else, but the investments were terrible. Um, so these obvious investments sometimes are not great. So just think about that. Um, so I know we all want to just think about that. I guess I won't make any other comments than that. Um, if something's really, really obvious, somebody's probably thought about it before. Um, so is the people that were investing in renewables 20 years ago that are the ones that are going to make a lot of money. All right. I think we're going to end it there. So thank you for the questions. Um, we will talk about something different on Thursday. We're going to talk about financial advice, um, and particularly how do you get the benefits of financial advice? Um, so whether that's behavioral coaching, whether that's setting goals and creating a plan, how you can do that on your own. Um, so slightly different topic, which I think will be nice for everyone. So thank you guys very much for joining. And if you have any questions, just send them in to me. So mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.